So Singed by History, Lucy S. Davidovich, Polish Jewish Relations and Holocaust Historiography. Uh, the impetus for this book many, in many ways was the memoir that Anne, Dr. Anne Hoffman mentioned from, from that place in time, 1937 to 1946, which was Lucy S. Davidovich's reflections on a period of her life when she was um, enclosed in what I would call a European world, both in Europe and in New York. And the book, I read the book when it first came out in 1989, I was captivated by it. And particularly I was captivated by Lucy S. Davidovich's commitment to diaspora nationalism, that ideology of the 19th century, which posited like Zionism, but differently that the Jews were a people, a transnational or global people. And East European Jewry was a transnational and global entity and Yiddish, the Yiddish language was at the core of the creation of this peoplehood. And I was again captivated by these ideas that she expressed in her book. And I thought to I thought about her, but I left that book behind, if you will, or the topic behind to do my first book um, on the Jewish Enlightenment in Poland, um, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century study of someone named Mendelevn of Satanu and his disciple Josef Perel. I mentioned this because my book now, from left to right, Lucy S. Davidovich, The New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History, is to my mind, a intellectual continuum with my first book. That is, I am interested in the intellectual, cultural, and political identity of modern Jews of East European origin. And I argue that that history is always global or transnational, as we would say today. And it always addresses those, the intel the intelligentsia or the intellectuals who are concerned about the intellectual, political, and cultural identity of modern Jews are addressing a similar set of questions. So even though it might seem that the late 18th century is very far away from the 20th, I would argue that the questions addressed by Mendelevn of Satanov and the questions addressed by Lucy S. Davidovich are in fact very similar. And um, I would also argue that they remain um, with us today in the contemporary world. Um, the other um, stimulus for the book was to put Lucy S. Davidovich, a Jewish immigrant daughter of Polish origin, in conversation with the very famous male New York intellectuals, uh, the boys, if you will, of City College. And they, as many of you know, saw themselves as kind of outsiders or marginal figures who entered the American landscape or meant to, meant, entered American public life um, through their marginality, through writing about cosmopolitan, universalist, humanistic concerns, not as Jews per se, even though they were indeed Jewish immigrant sons. Lucy S. Davidovich um, acculturated, encountered America from a very different background. And I wanted her background and who she was and her experiences to kind of interrogate the assumption that the New York intellectuals way of doing things, if you will, was the only way. And um, she also was female. So that um, allowed me to think about gender and the interaction of American culture mid-century if you were a man, a married man and a public figure versus if you were a married woman and not yet a public figure. Lucy S. Davidovich became important to the male New York intellectuals in the late 60s and early 70s when she began to publish on East European Jewish life, on the civilization of Polish Jewry, and on the destruction of European Jews, what of course we now call Holocaust studies, but then was just emerging as a field. And when they turned back, if you will, or they began to reinvestigate their relationship to their immigrant backgrounds, they found her. She had gravitas because of her life and because of what she had experienced. So I wanted to put her in conversation with them in terms of the questions about the acculturation of immigrants of East European origin to the American diasporic landscape. So that is what um, I did in the book. And I will now narrate for you very quickly her biography or some of the uh, seminal points in her biography and how they shaped her reactions to this issue called Polish Jewish relations, how she understood the Holocaust and how uh, she had a very distinctive view, if you will, of what the right interpretation was of the final solution and of the destruction of the Jews of Europe. So um, the book, um, just to nod again to the book, the book is written 
in a transnational way. I write about her in the first part as an immigrant daughter. Then I write about her European experiences and her New York experience at the YIVO enclosed in an East European Jewish environment. Then I talk about her entry into mainstream America through her work at the American Jewish Committee. And finally, I talk about this disjunction between her East European diaspora nationalist ideology facing an American culture in the late 60s and 70s, um, in which Jewish groupness is not necessarily understood or accepted. And this is part of her reaction to the way liberalism is shaped in those years and part of what pushes her rightward to identify as a neoconservative. So the book oscillates between the American stage, the European stage, the consciousness of her as an American, her consciousness as an East European. So that's the overall structure of the book. But let's start at her beginnings. As I said, Lucy Davidovich then was Lucy Schildkret. She wasn't Davidovich until 1948. She was a Jewish immigrant daughter in the interwar years in New York, born in 1915. And like most immigrant children, she went to the American public school system, the New York City public school system to be precise. And she also, as you can see from the left side of the slide, was also educated in Yiddishist institutions. So unlike the male New York intellectuals, the Irving Howes, Daniel Bells, Nathan Klazers, Norman Bodharitz, although Norman actually studied at JTS, she actually had a strong Jewish background in the secular Yiddish school movements that uh, existed in the interwar years. There were actually four Yiddish school movements in New York um, in the interwar years. So Lucy went to New York City's public schools. She was bright enough to go to the Hunter College High School for Girls, which was single sex, and then to go to Hunter College itself, which was single sex. She had a rigorous education there, majored in English, was devoted to literature, and devoted to English letters. But as I said, she also was educated at, in Yiddish institutions, and specifically at the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute, which was a nonpartisan Yiddish school movement with a summer camp. And it is extremely important to her. She goes there after school three days a week, goes to the Mittelschule, the high school on the weekends, and attends the summer camp, which was a completely Yiddishist environment. Her mentors in those years were Polish immigrants, many of whom were historians, including uh, Jankov Schatzky, the social psychologist Leibish Lehrer, and others. And what's important, therefore, to understand is that from her very earliest years as a sort of maturing adult, she is steeped in Yiddish culture, steeped in diaspora nationalism, steeped in the global sense of Jewish peoplehood, and also more aware than most people, most other Americans, of what is going on in Europe. And that is very important. In 1937, she penned an editorial in the Shalom Aleichem Folk Institute's uh, magazine, which was called Schrift. And it, the title was Elvet Zeynit Reustreiben, You Will Not Drive Them Out. And this was an editorial against uh, the Polish parliament, which in 1937 embraced the idea that emigration of Jews from Poland was the solution to the complexities of ethnic minorities in the increasingly ethno-national state of the Second Republic. So already we see that in 1937, she's a young person, right? She's all of um, 22 years old, and she's writing a editorial against the, the Polish state's treatment of the Jews. So when we think about her attitudes towards Poland and towards uh, Polish Jewish relations, we can see already that she is forming some ideas about uh, what is going on in Europe. After she graduated from Hunter, she was marginally employed and Jakob Schatzky encouraged her to go back to graduate school, but not in history, not in literature, but in history. She had briefly dallied uh, for two weeks studying uh, at, for, at a master's level. And she embraced the idea of studying history and did a lot of research at the New York Public Library. And she also was encouraged by Schatzky to go to Vilna, Poland, to be a research fellow in a program called the Aspirantur at the, at the YIVO, the Yiddish Wissenschaftler Institute, which was a sort of secular university um, steeped in diaspora nationalism and its commitments to Jewish peoplehood, East European Jewish identity and Yiddish culture. And that is what she did. So in 1938, um, she applies to the YIVO, she gets an acceptance letter, and she sails off to uh, Poland. 
at the end of the summer. And here you see that the Jewish Daily Forward, the Fallwelts, is taking note of this young American woman, Liebe Schildkret, who's going off to Poland to study at the YIVO. So it was a bit of a sensation. Um, she arrives um, in early September of 1938 and spends roughly a year in Vilna. Vilna um, is a major city in interwar Poland. It's somewhat separated from, um, it's, a, it's a, known as a Lithuanian city, but because of the borders that were um, forged after World War I, it's an interwar Poland. There are actually far fewer Lithuanians living in Lithuania than there are um, Germans, Jews, Poles, and even some others. So it's an unusually multi-ethnic city. It is known as being a great city of rabbinic culture and also in many ways, the center of secular Yiddish land. And the YIVO is very much at the center of that. In those years, she does what all graduate students do. She flirts with boys, she smokes a lot of cigarettes, she works on her thesis, she complains about her writing. Um, and she is involved in a kind of silo-like environment of modern secular Yiddish culture. But the environment of interwar Poland had an effect on her. She was, of course, aware of the looming crisis from the West of Nazi Germany. And she is also aware of what's going on on the streets in interwar Poland. So we already see in these years, uh, her sense of the difference between Jewish Poles and Christian Poles. And she actually entitles in her memoir, the chapter on this, them and us. So a very binary view of non-Jewish Poles and Jewish Poles. Um, in some ways, it was a very justified view. Jews had lived in Pol the Poland for over a thousand years, and I always argue that they were a part of Poland, but they were apart from Poland. They were a distinctive ethnic majority in urban centers with a distinctive religion and language and saw themselves, had an extremely strong sense of national consciousness. And by the end of the interwar years, after the death of Marshal Plasudski, who had sort of kept ethno-nationalism to some degree at bay, the, the right-wing uh, National Democrats, that's the party associated with Roman Dumovsky, have much more sway over the street culture and the intellectual culture of Poland. And the universities actually come a site of anti-Semitic um, efforts, including the efforts to create so-called ghetto benches, ghetto benches, and the professoriate is really unfortunately steeped in anti-Jewish attitudes. And we find both in the daily press in Poland and also recollections by others, by students who are at the universities, the uh, anti-Semitic attitudes. And Lucy, S., uh, Lucy Schilkrit talks about hooliganism. She talks about the street violence that preyed upon Jews in the streets of Vilna. And she remarks in her memoir about walking down the street with Chaim Gada, the great Yiddish poet, and he takes her arm and kind of moves her into a cul-de-sac because of uh, there's a group of like hooligans, of student hooligans. And Max Weinreich, her mentor at the YIVA, was blind, blinded in one eye to a pogrom against students and uh, by students against uh, Jews. And Mayor Bauermann, a very important Polish Jewish historian, was also harmed in um, Lwów. And we have other evidence, uh, newer evidence, uh, that women were as vulnerable as men, that students broke into classrooms and actually threw Jewish students out windows. So this is a, this is a tense time. And I want to uh, emphasize that the fact that the anti-Semitic attitudes and efforts came not only from uh, right-wing paramilitary types and and some efforts in the parliament, the, the um, legislation to ban kosher slaughter, but it came from institutions, the universities that were supposed to be liberal. And that is something that will affect her for the rest of her life. Despite this rather um, dark uh, image I've just given you, she was having a very good time at the Evo, felt very much, much at home, was uh, felt mentored by Max Weinreich, was beloved by someone named Zele Kalmanovich and his wife, Rivala Kalmanov, Kalmanovich. She had friends. She was part of a cohort of young people who were studying with the luminaries of Yiddish culture. So she almost stayed for a second year. But the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact at the end of August changed everything. 
The American government sent a letter to nationals abroad saying there would be a war. And her friends in, at Evo, particularly Rivala Kalmanovich, said to her in so no uncertain terms, you're an American, you don't know what a war is, you have a passport, you need to leave. And that's what she did. So Lucy, Lucy Schildkret took an extraordinary journey from Vilna to Warsaw to Berlin to Copenhagen at the very end of August. And by the time she got to Copenhagen, the war had begun, right? The Germans had invaded Poland. Um, Yivo and, and, and Vilna were under Soviet occupation, but nonetheless, the war had begun. And so you can just imagine what this was like for a young American girl who was filled with all the aspirations and hopes that are part of an American herit uh, heritage, uh, fleeing, fleeing, and fleeing because she was an American. So this is also very important for, if you will, singeing her experiences in Europe. Uh, the last thing that she did before she fled is also very important in understanding her views towards Polish Jewish relations. The school children of the Tsisho, which was the um, overarching Central Yiddish School Commission in Poland, had created an exhibit on Jewish life in Poland that was supposed to open in Warsaw. And Lucy actually traveled to Warsaw before she left to view the exhibit, which had been shut down by the educational a commission of Poland. This exhibit demonstrated the rootedness, in Yiddish we say doikite, of Jews in Polish lands, showed their geographic dispersion, showed their um, involvement with the Polish economy, Polish arts, Polish music, uh, the development of Polish poetry and language. That is, it show, the exhibit showed how Polish the Jews were. But of course, towards the end of the interwar years, this was precisely not what, what the government wanted to emphasize. They had already sort of absorbed the alienness or the otherness of Jews. And this struck at the heart of the Yivos project to show the rootedness of Jews in Eastern Europe. And of course had a great effect on her, the idea that the, the Jews were being excised, if you will, from Polish history. And she was probably one of the last people to ever see this exhibit, which never was hung for the public. When she got back to New York, she briefly worked in Albany, but was then called by Max Weinreich, the linguist who is the head of the Evo, who had also gotten out of Europe because of a really uh, fortuitous uh, circumstance, accidental. He was on his way to a linguistics conference and he wanted to bolster the American branch of the Evo in New York. And he asked her to come and work for him. And she did, she worked for six years at the New York Evo. Um, the Amaptel, the American branch of the YIVO. And what's so important again about this to underscore her Europeanness or her singedness is that she's working in an environment, an immigrant refugee environment. Many of the people at the YIVO were uh, immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants and refugees and, and, and people who had gotten out of Poland often through the Soviet zone uh, came to work for the YIVO. And in those years, the YIVO was like a little center of East European uh, Jewish uh, life and culture. And I'll just rattle off some names to give you, even though you may not know them, a sense of who these people were. Yaakov Shatsky, Rafael Mahler, Yudel Mark, Judah Jaffe, Shmuel Nigel, Israel Knox, Roman Jacobson, Yaakov Leschinsky, Abraham Dukern, Nathaniel Reich, Rachel Wisnitzer Bernstein, Joseph Potoshu, Elias and Riva Cherokova, Zosha Shakovsky. It's like a little hotbed, if you will, or a little cell of East European concerns and intellectuals. And she was right there in them. And plus she had the connection to Weinreich and the connection to having been in Vilna before the war broke out. And this meant that the environment in which she, she was working was much more attuned to what was going on in Poland than other American Jews, even if they were sensitized to what was going on. Remember, America had not yet entered the war. And in fact, Lucy was tasked to draw the map of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1940 um, in Yivo one of the publications of the American branch. So I'm trying to again to underscore for you that she's her research on the Jews of Eastern Europe and her sensitivities to uh, what's going on in Poland are already very much part of her life experience, even though she's an American immigrant Jew. She's not a Polish Jew, but she's acquiring, if you will, she's on her way to acquiring a Polish Jewish soul and certainly mind. And in those years, actually, she met the man who would later become her husband, 
His name was Shimon Davidovich. He had gotten out on a political visa. He was a Bundist, a socialist, and he, they were vulnerable to the Soviets. And Shimon came to work at the YIVO as a copy editor. And his family, his wife and two children were incarcerated in the Warsaw ghetto. So here you can imagine everyone at the YIVO uh, in these years, and think now they're aware of the great deportations that are starting in 1942. And they are aware of the Jewish underground and of the plans of the Bund, and they're wondering what's going to happen. And they, of course, know and are notified almost sooner than anyone else about what's happening in 1943 with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And Shimon himself um, will lose his family in these events. And again, this is another part that emphasizes how, she, how Lucy Davidovich is going to feel about Poland and the Poles. Shimon's daughter, Topcha Davidovich, and here you have a kind of incredible picture of her on the left with her mother, with the armband of the incarcerated Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. Topcha was a ghetto fighter, and she perished at the end of the war because she sprained her ankle and she could not exit through the sewers. So she died with her comrades. And uh, after the war, Shimon was given a posthumous award for his daughter and her gymnasium certificate. And you see on the right, the slide is, um, the photograph is from their home. Lucy and Shimon got married in 1948. And this hung kind of like an, a shrine or altar to the perished, his perished daughter. And I think it's important, and maybe the Q&A will come up a little bit more, it's important to understand that Lucy and Shimon knew well what it meant to be a ghetto fighter, but Lucy later refused and really fought back against the interpretation by many that the litmus test for Jewish heroism was militant resistance. That is, she fought back against the iconization of the ghetto fighters, which happened both in the communist sphere, it happened among the Zionists, it happened among the socialists, right? That the right way to respond to oppression is militancy and military action. And it's not to say she didn't know about it. She did know about it because of Topcha, who stays, who stays in her heart and in her writings. After the war, she decides to go back to Europe. So this is the second fateful journey. She's hired by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to work with DPs. And again, this is a very important story. She works there from 19, um, uh, the, um, September 1946 to December 1947. She works in both the American and the British zones of occupation. Those are very different experiences. Um, I will foreground here just the American zone because she is instrumental in working for the JDC's educational department, which is providing textbooks, theater props, writing utensils for the schools of the DP camps. And she's also um, instrumental, instrumental in helping the figures of the Central Historical Commission. The, these are historians, um, including someone like Philip Friedman, who was a pre-war historian, survives um, in Ukraine. His wife and child is murdered. He then gets back to the DP camps and immediately starts to document uh, what's happened. And Yiddish speakers call this the Holden, right? The destruction. They, the word Holocaust obviously is an English translation of Shoah, the Hebrew word. They called it the Holden. They connected it to earlier catastrophes. And this is part of the historiographic tradition uh, born in this time called Holbenforschung, the, uh, the historiography of destruction, which does relates directly to the East European historiographic tradition inaugurated by Shimon Dubnov at the end of the 19th century, which focuses on Jewish sources, on responding to commemoration, and also providing a uh, a Jewish-centered perspective on what has happened. And, and Friedman and others in the historical commissions are devoted to this method. And Lucy helps them by getting Yiddish matrices and linotypes for their publications, as, as well as helping to, uh, to um, publish testimonies, some of the first survivor testimonies we have. So here you see the journal of the Central Historical Commission, von Lexden Holden. And this is, the, one of the earliest document, documentations of a survivor narratives. Again, Judeo-centric in Jewish languages from the Jews themselves. And that's important to hold on to in then considering what she will do later when she writes her own works on the Holocaust. 
Besides this extraordinary work of getting the last Yiddish matrices to the uh, DP Camp Historical Commission, she is also centrally involved in the salvaging, cataloging, and shipment of Vilna's cultural treasures that had been plundered by the Nazis and uh, the remains of which were in the Offenbach Archival Depot in uh, Frankfurt. And she, through her, through intercession with the JDC and working with Weinreich in New York, uh, is able to convince her um, bosses that she should catalog these books and help document which ones came from Vilna. And again, this is a long and complicated story and there's some wonderful new scholarship specifically on these issues of the transfer of these cultural treasures to New York. But suffice to say that Lucy herself was in the trenches with the dust, with the books, cataloging them, writing to Weinreich. And in June, 1947, Seymour Pomerantz, who's a YIVO activist and a librarian at the Library of Congress, comes back to Europe where he had first worked at the Offenbach Archival Depot and oversees the shipment of 420 cases of books of YIVO's materials and other treasures from Vilna to the New York YIVO. And this shows you uh, some of the men and the, the, the activists examining the treasures and there's all kinds of marvelous things. And these archival riches are now in New York at the New York YIVO. So she was instrumental again in salvaging, if you will, this, um, uh, the, the cultural remnant of Polish Jewry. And she ends her memoir from that place in time with these events. And she said very clearly that um, this was her act of, um, not repentance, but of expiation of her guilt. She says, once the Yivo library had been shipped to New York, I felt that I had laid to rest those ghosts of Vilna that had haunted me since 1939. I had realized the obsessive fantasies of rescue, which had tormented me for years. I had in fact saved a few remnants of Vilna, even if they were just books, mere pieces of paper, the tatters, the tatters and shards of civilization." Unquote. And I want you again to think about this word civilization. For Lucy Davidovich, Hitler successfully extirpated a thousand year old civilization of the Jews in Europe. And she saw her work on the Holocaust as telling people about that loss. That was what her motivation was. Again, it comes out of her diaspora nationalism. The Jews were a people rooted in Eastern Europe and this war, the Holocaust, the Holden, extirpated this civilization. And this is going to be the driving force of her historiography. She left, um, when she returned to um, the United States, she ended up working at the American Jewish Committee for two decades. I have lots to say about that, but not today. What's important is that she worked in several areas at the committee, including uh, liberal anti-communism, church state relations, um, and what was then called Negro Jewish relations. And she also wrote for Commentary Magazine, including doing a lot of book reviewing. And in those years, she began the work on the anthology, The Golden Tradition, Jewish Life and Thought in Eastern Europe, which she published in 1967. And you can see the quote on the back emphasizes this idea of the Jewish civilization of Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was the cradle of almost every important Jewish cultural, religious, and national movement, and the area where Jewish faith, thought, and culture flourished unsurpassed. In anthologizing these texts, I was guided by the desire to show the diversity of Jews and their culture, the centripetal and centrifugal forces that moved them and the variety they brought to Jewish thought and life. East European Jewry was not, as the sentimentalists see it, forever frozen in utter piety and utter poverty. So again, you see her sense of Eastern Europe is a world and that it is her task as an historian of the Jew Jews to document that world from a Judeo-centric place, from the voices of the Jews themselves. This is an anthology of translated material of Jewish writings. This book began to put her on the map. She's not yet fully a public intellectual, but in many ways she is getting there because the book is widely reviewed, including by Irving Howe, who is in some ways the, the New York intellectual par excellence. 
And it also is her stepping stone to leave the American Jewish Committee and to begin a life as a full-time scholar. And she's hired by Stern College of Yeshiva University to teach courses on Jewish social history. But it ends up that what she, she cannot um, extract herself from the history of the Jews of Eastern Europe and of what is beginning to be called and named the Holocaust. So in fact, she offers one of the first seminars on the Holocaust. And here you see the first page of her seminar from uh, March, 1969. And it may be too small for your screens, which, for which I apologize, but I can assure you that um, number one says antecedents and sub substructure from Mein Kampf to the Vance Conference. And that tells you something about her worldview. She believes that the final, final solution was intended. She is known as an intentionalist, that it was due to Hitler's anti-Semitic obsessions that are already articulated in Mein Kampf and are developed in the 20s and then all the way up to his prophecy and then of course the attack um, on Poland. And this is very much her perspective. Ideas matter, great men in history matter, and Hitler really matters. And I emphasize that because there will be pushback to these views. But at that moment, uh, this is very much her perspective. And it's a perspective that she um, enforces in her book uh, that made her famous, The War Against the Jews on the Left, 1933. You see the dating there to Hitler's uh, election as chancellor and then his um, uh, taking over of uh, the German government to 1945. The book is written in two sections. Uh, the first part focuses on ideology and anti-Semitism, and the second part focuses on the Jewish response to it. Again, very important historiographic move that the Holocaust must tell the story of the Jews, their reactions of Jewish communal uh, dignity, how people survived. And again, very different than the other English language books that are available at this time, which tend to focus like Raoul Hilberg's extraordinary study of the German military machine, of other books that are biographies of Hitler, and very importantly, and again for the Q&A, Hannah Arendt's uh, reportage on the Eichmann trial in 1963, which emphasizes the sort of banality of and, and downplays ideology. Um, Lucy Estavidovich's book emphasizes the centrality of ideology. I also want to mention that she does give some uh, nods, if you will, to her view of Polish -Jew Jewish relations in the war against the Jews. She says, quote, in 1939, Jews knew that they would suffer the hardships that were the common lot of war. They knew also that as Jews, they would endure still other afflictions at the hands of the Germans and even of the Poles, among whom they had lived for centuries more in tension than com comradeship unquote. And then she also goes on to mention in her study the endemic anti-Jewish attitudes at Polish universities and the steady diminution of Jewish status and social, um, social stability and security after Pilsudski's death. The War Against the Jews made her a household name. She then went on to publish an anthology of sources, The Holocaust Reader, and then a study on historiography, The Holocaust and the Historians. Because she had a household name, she um, began to be um, a, pub a public intellectual and was noticed by others. And she was actually appointed to the US Holocaust Memorial Commission uh, to be part of the committee to talk about or decide and design a memorial uh, for the murdered Jews of Europe. She was very different than other members of the commission. She felt that the memorial should tell the story of the Jews, the war against the Jews because her position was that while there was a conventional war, there was also a specific ideologically motivated war against the Jews. And that's what, if anything, should be commemorated in the US Holocaust uh, Memorial. Um, at the time, there was a lot of debate about what other uh, peoples should be mentioned in the memorial. There was a discussion of whether or not the suffering of political prisoners, of gays, uh, of members of the Roma Sinti community should be acknowledged. And these were very fraught discussions in the commission. But it what was particularly fraught was the whole question of the suffering of East Europeans, non-Jewish East Europeans. How should that be narrated? 
and Elie Wiesel and Chaim Bookbender and, and Bookbinder and uh, Michael Berenbaum, Lucy, it's Greenberg, all debated these questions. And she and Wiesel, but she in particular, felt very strongly against representing the suffering of Poles in the US Holocaust Memorial. Um, and again, this is a, a huge question today, and I hope in the Q&A we'll be able to, to discuss it. So um, there was a lot of pushback. Polish intellectuals wrote to the commission. They wanted the representation of Polish suffering. And when the, when the commission decided to uh, universalize aspects of the Holocaust, Lucy Davidovich resigned. And she wrote very clearly a big no, this is no longer for her. She had already reacted to the um, depiction of Polish suffering or of what has come to be called the righteous Pole or the righteous Gentile in popular culture. In 1960, she wrote a, a scathing review of Rod Serling's In the Presence of Mine Enemies, a television drama that was set in the Warsaw Ghetto. The drama blurred the distinction between perpetrators and victims. The Nazi in the play falls in love with the Jewish daughter who has been raped by the Nazi's commander. The Gentile Polish friend of the Jewish family commits suicide in despair over his neighbor's fate. And the rabbi castigates his son for vengeful feelings against their oppressors. Davidovich just uh, att attacked the review she said there is nothing in it that did not offend or outrage with its falseness and fraudulence. And she continued, yes, there were decent Poles who risked their lives to help Jews hide from the Nazis, a few hundred, perhaps a few thousand. But there were tens of thousands who sold Jews protection at outrageous prices, who turned them in for a half pound of sugar, who helped the Nazis hasten them to the gas chambers. The Poles were not like the Danes, the Dutch, the French, Belgians, or Italians. Only the Ukrainians outdid them in helping Germans wipe out the Jews. But Serling has created a Pole who not only helped, but who sacrificed himself for Jews. We can also see uh, her reaction to Sophie's choice again, outrage at the depiction of this righteous Gentile, right? Or not a righteous Gentile, but the suffering of a Polish woman um, and, a, and a kind of crazed Jewish, uh, her lover is a crazed and, and rather um, uh, abusive person. And this book got a lot of play. It was made into an award-winning movie. Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein worked their magic as they always do. But the book was one that, again, got under Lucy's skin and other critics, by the way, because of its rather, dis what she felt was its distorted view of who the victims were during uh, the Holocaust. And Styron's book has its own life because he ended up, uh, he ended up being in conversation with something, Richard Rubenstein, a theologian, God is Dead theology, and uh, their books mutually used each other in various forewords. And again, this was part and parcel of a, a shift in understanding what had happened during the European catastrophe, a move, if you will, towards universalism, of downplaying, at least in Lucy Davidovich's perspective, the singularity and the distinctiveness of Jewish suffering. And um, I wanna be careful that we, I don't run out of time, but I just want to um, emphasize, I hope for you, that her experience living in rural Poland, her commitment to diaspora nationalism, her sense that Jews had a distinct and long history in Eastern Europe and were never fully part of Polish life, this shaped her interpretation of the Holocaust, that what had to be remembered was the distinctiveness of Jewish civilization. And in fact, that's what had been lost. Hitler's war against the Jewish civilization of Europe was successful. So it's another part of her, um, her historiographic concerns is that the story of the victims is what had to be told, not necessarily the story of the survivors, and certainly not the story of those few hundred Poles who, yes, indeed risked their lives to save Jews, but were a small, small, you know, drop in the bucket of, the, the, of Jewish suffering um, during the war. Another place where you can see her very strong attitudes are in the chapter on Polish, Jewish, uh, Polish historiography in the Holocaust um, uh, and the historians. 
where she's very clear that the post-war Polish historians, because they are living in the communist bloc, cannot tell the full story of the distinctiveness of Jewish suffering. Communism, of course, was devoted to a universalist understanding of what had happened. The Germans were fascist. The, the Soviet Union had fought an anti-fascist, anti-imperialist war. They did not want to distinguish between uh, the crimes against Jews and the crimes against others. This, they said, would play into the racialized view of human history. Many of you will know that one of the challenges in the post-war years for Jews living in Soviet lands or the occupied lands of the Soviet Union cannot commemorate their dead as Jews. And there's, a, um, I think someone on the call could perhaps speak directly to uh, the Ukrainian monument at Babi Yar. Lucy also wrote about this, but I'm not going to go there right now. That's a Ukrainian problem. But she emphasized in this chapter the uh, erasure of Jewish suffering by many Polish historians. And she even pointed the finger at those Jews who were involved with the Jewish Historical Institute, Zich, who had to uphold the party line. So she's got a strong Cold War anti-communist uh, understanding of the historiography that's playing out in, the, in, in uh, communist Poland, in the Soviet Union, and in other lands. And this minimizes Jewish distinctiveness. So she goes after it. And um, that, that chapter is, is, is very strong um, against Polish historiography and the Jews who write it in Polish lands. Uh, finally, in terms of understanding Polish-Jewish relations, there's another yet another uh, event or publication where she weighs in on this topic. And that is the publication of an extraordinary interview with an extraordinary figure, Marek Edelman, who is the last surviving commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Edelman is a very important hero and a very complicated one. And arguably who he is has been distorted the way all people are who serve ideological functions. I will just tell, tell you that Edelman was a commander and he wrote an important uh, work uh, Quick, uh, right after the war called Ghetto Valce, the Ghetto Fights, and it was translated. And in it, he is very clear, A, that he does not consider himself a hero. B, that he does not consider ghetto fighters more heroic, as he said, than the 400,000 Jews of Warsaw who walked quietly with dignity to the Unschlagplatz, right? He does not want to be made into an icon. But, uh, and, and he says this in interviews in Polish papers, but, um, this uh, work in, 19, um, in the late 19, early 1980s, excuse me, the, the interview with Hannah Kral makes him into a hero. And um, it is widely reviewed um, and it sets off a whole debate about Polish Jewish relations. And this debate takes place in a very public way in the New York Review of Books and commentary among major figures, Abraham Bromberg, uh, Norman Davies, and Lucy S. Davidovich weighs in in an article in Commentary in 1987. And in it, she, she says that Edelman is not an exemplar. He, may, he was heroic, but he's not an exemplar. He is one of the few survivors who stayed in Poland. He did so for very personal reasons, she concludes. He was a doctor living in relative anonymity in Łódź until this interview was published. His wife and child had left Poland after 1968. You may know there was an anti-Semitic campaign in Poland and many, many of the remaining Polish Jews left. And so he's, she argues that he is his staying in Poland, his identification with Poland is not an example of the feelings or the reality of most Polish Jews. And one should not construe or interpret Edelman's understanding as the understanding of Polish Jew, Jewish relations. And she argues, as well as Abraham Brumberg, that Norman Davies, uh, historian of Poland, and others misunderstood the irony in Edelman's first interview, where he talked about the Poles as the most tolerant of peoples, that there's irony in this, because Edelman had lived through the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the disappointments and betrayals of the Home Army, the Armia Krajowa, and the underground in supplying the Jews of Warsaw with the necessary weapons. I mean, they couldn't have won anyway, but uh, they and they did withstand for five weeks. 
So this, again, is a very big public uh, um, a brouhaha about Polish-Jewish relations. And as I said, Lucy Davidovich comes down strongly on the anti-Semitic um, nature of uh, many, many Poles in the pre-war period, during the war, and after the war. And of course, 1968 and the anti-Zionist uh, purge is, uh, is evidence to support her claim. Um, there were lots of letters to Commentary Magazine after this piece. That happened a lot in her life. She would write a controversial piece, and then it, uh, lots of people would respond, often negatively. But she was, including Norman Davies, who at the time was involved with a suit against Stanford University. That's, again, another story which I talk about in the book. But she criticizes Davies' bias, and she says, because he equated the condition of the Jews under not. Nazi occupation to the condition of Poles under Nazi occupation. He said, Davies says these are equivalent and why aren't more people paying attention to Pol Christian Polish suffering? And she says in her letter, quote, no one with even the most superficial knowledge of World War II and the fate of the Jews could equate the situation of Poles and Jews under the German occupation. Anyone familiar with the bare facts would straightaway recognize the wrongness and yes, the wickedness inherent in, make, in making such an equivalence. It is another example of Mr. Davies's historical malfeasance, unquote. And the bottom line for her is that she saw her task as telling, telling the story of the great Polish Jewish civilization that had been the cradle of, and we saw that in the quote of, at, with the um, golden tradition, the cradle of modern Jewish life began in Poland from her perspective. And this civilization was destroyed. The Polish Jews did not survive. The Polish people survived and they have a country and a nation, even if the political system is not to their liking. But the Polish Jews, she wrote, did not survive. And at the very end of her life, she was interviewed by Carol Kessner. And in this interview, she gave one last opinion about her view of interwar Polish-Jewish relations. And she said, quote, it's very fashionable now among some historians to say that Polish anti-Semitism has been greatly exaggerated. I hope that by spelling it out in her memoir, in small detail, what really happened, my book will help to set the record straight, unquote. So she wrote this at the e very end of her life and she never, uh, she never varied from that. And so one of the questions I've always asked myself is had she lived longer, she died in 1975, what would she have made, if anything, of the thaw uh, post-1991 in the study of Polish-Jewish history and Polish-Jewish relations, in the investment in the Jewish past in Poland? Uh, after 1991, alas, today we're looking at a whole new political landscape and some of that optimism, some of that camaraderie, some of that uh, cooperation uh, is no longer what we can boast about, but we could for about a decade and a half. So thank you very much. I look forward to uh, the questions from my esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, this was great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nancy. You've given us a lot to think about. Magda, would you like to begin? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you on this amazing book that is so rich and goes so beyond where we both started. <laughs> <laughs> we met in Warsaw in 1993. Three. In the summer or two, or I don't remember. It was 1993. Um, I remembered it was like yesterday. You were my guardian angel. <laughs> so it's it, it it's taken you along. It's it's a really incredible book. So deeply researched. So thoughtful. So uh, you know, there's so much to to think about and talk about. Probably for weeks and uh, and many many conversations. Uh, and I hope we will touch upon some of the issues that the book raises beyond what your uh, talk today was. Um, I do want to 
want you to uh, to talk a little bit about her uh, Americanness. That is, you put the Americanness at the point later in her life, as as when she become joins the AJC. But I am wondering how much, what role her Americanness played earlier in her life when she goes to Vilna in 1938, even before she goes to Vilna in 1938. I'm wondering what, you know, she's a student hunter. She went to Hunter High School. You talked about her response to the 1937 uh, laws and her, and her, and her, um, in her uh, op-ed, and I'm just wondering, what were her sources of knowledge? Were there were there immigrant or Yiddish Jewish sources of knowledge, or were there also American sources of knowledge that she uh, absorbs and you know becomes American and goes as an American to Vilna in 1938? So, so first, thank you and. Really, I'm so, so delighted to have this conversation. I hope we can have a little bit more time than the Zoom hour. Um, look, look, of course she's an American, but I think it's important. And, you know, when you read and, and see the footage and think about the worldview of those immigrant communities, they're American immigrant communities, but they're very much immigrant communities. There's a kind of homogeneity. I mean, it's not that they're, in the Bronx, there weren't uh, non-Jews living in the na neighborhood, there were. But as a rule, I mean, I looked at the Hunter, I went through the Hunter College archives, both the, the archives that had the high school periodicals and also the, um, the, the yearbooks. 80% of, of the student body in those in, at Hunter and at Brooklyn College were Jews. So they're American Jews, but they're real, they're so close to this immigrant experience. So it's not that they're not American, but it's a Americanism that's shaded by an immigrant environment. And in her case, all the more so, I wanna be clear, I don't think it's overdetermined that she became who she was. She made choices. She was drawn to uh, an investment and engagement with Europe. Um, her sister, she's a sister five years younger, who's a similar trajectory, meaning went to Hunter and the whole business, absolutely not interested, um, was also anti-communist at some point, but has none of the intellectual power of, of Lucy and, is not interested. So she is, of course, she's clearly an American, but you see in her writings a kind of process of disengagement with, um, it's, it's interesting thing about the world we're living in, a disengagement with the hegemonic culture of English letters, if I can use those. You know, she thought she was going to be an English professor, right? That's what you did, I mean, if you were smart. You went to a place like Hunter or City College, you studied the greats, you wanted to become an American, so you did the Americans better by writing about them. I think about Alfred Kaysen and Irving Howe and Trilling, and you know, you wrote English better than the King, so to speak, and they're, they are terrific. And she was sort of on that pathway. She was going to get a master's, and then she says very clearly, Keats and Wordsworth no longer spoke to me. So there's a kind of disengagement now, that may be very American. I'm not an American studies. That disengagement from the majority culture may itself be an American act because you can choose. Again, I'm going off on in meta in ways I don't really know how to speak. But I mean, she disengages with that trajectory and makes a choice. And that choice is to go to Europe. And that choice is to be nurtured by the Schatzkys, the Labish Lehrers, later the Weinreichs, the Kalmanoviches, the Gladys, the Sutzkevels. I mean, I'm speaking it with their Yiddish names because I think it's important. Um, and that was part of her education, but she chose it. So um, I think she felt very American the second she arrived in Vilna. Right. But Amanda, also, I think you might want to go. American second generation experience of feeling something lacking, right? And needing to go back somewhere else to gain that, those roots, those cultural roots. So at some level, and, I, and that's what I'm sort of trying to see because you are, you know, in-, in But not everyone felt that. Let's just be clear. That's not, not also, I mean, think of Deborah Dash Moore's, you know, first book, you know, At Home in America. That details the same types, right? And they're, thoroughly Americanized. I mean, not, in t you know, they make Jewish communities. I mean, you, you know the book, but she makes it, not all sec second, there's a variety of second generation experiences. 
I'll just. And is it possible, Nancy, that somehow displacement in some kind of a structural sense is important in shaping who she becomes? That she goes to Vilma. You know, I was. I think your your story in the book of her age, her agency. Okay, in in trying to save the books and retrieve them and have them sent to New York and everything she has to ward off there. But there's also a recognition of the loss, right? You can never oh. return those books to their owners. But there's something. You know, I'm thinking about your title for your talk this afternoon, "Singed by History." And there is something in that brush with history, the way she has to leave in August 39, yeah. but when she comes back in 46, and, and then she herself, I think you're quoting her when you say she's a, she felt she's a, a pseudo survivor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, she, there's something structural there of never being located in the place where you are. And I'm I, wondering if that's formative somehow. I, 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 I think 100%. I mean, um, I, in conversation with another great scholar whom we all regard, uh, Barbara Kirshen Let we were talking about this, and it, it's her positionality. And I think that that, um, and by the way, I think that this, you know, I'm not writing, a, I'm not going to write a comparative book, but when you think about um, other diaspora nationalists of other, in, and not Jews, you know, think about sort of um, the Marcus Garvey moment, right? And, and Afri Black Americans who then go to Africa, right, in search of something. And as soon as they get there, they realize how American they are, right? Or James Baldwin in Paris. And we could think of any number of back and forth. So I think um, uh, structural, positional, absolutely is defining. And that's why I, I wrote, I actually, that was the moment when I knew what the book was going to look like. It didn't happen so soon. <laughs> when I realized the way to write the book was in those four parts, sort of, the, and that are positional, right? The American immigrant experience, the, the European experience back in America, and then the disjunction or the fissure between this East European I, way of looking at the world on an American landscape that's very changed. So that, that I think it's very important. And that's where she's very different from the other, the male New York intellectuals. Now, some of them fought in the war. And again, I haven't followed their trajectories, but how famously spent the war years in Alaska reading, right? Very far away from the, the conflagration of the war. I mean, she gets out literally by the skin of her teeth and she talks about it. You know, she talks about being on the train with a very portly German who's a, you know, who's, a, who's talking about Poland's aggression. And she says it was like listening to a raving lunatic, you know? Um, she sees in Berlin that, uh, you know, parks and in Warsaw, parks are getting uh, dug up because they're going to be uh, corpses to put in them. So these are very close experiences. And she talks, she was not a survivor. She knows that, but she lived with someone who wasn't exactly a survivor, but who lost his family and she's haunted or singed by that experience. That's why I showed that picture of Topcha. She mentions this, by the way, I mean, I don't have the time, but when she goes, she, she travels to Europe as a married woman and loves Europe. But when she's in Paris, she mentions that she's gonna to go to the memorial, uh, the Holocaust Memorial, and she says, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, you know, is Shimon gonna be upset thinking about Topcha? Like it, it, it's part of their world. They, they, they can't really shake it. And a slide I didn't show, all of her books are devoted, you know, dedicated to the loss, to the Jews of Vilna, to Topcha and Zurich, um, Zarek, um, uh, Shimon's children, to the murdered historians, Bawa Banchipe, Ringelblum. So the loss is critical to her understanding. And that's, if I can just sort of re-emphasize, that's what, that's what she's fighting against. She's fighting against that illusion when people group the Holocaust, the destruction of the Jews with quote, other genocides, because it flattens the distinction of what was lost for Jews, which is the European experience. And, you know, Salo Baron, and I'm looking at Magda here, what, you know, our grandpère, back, back, you know, when he testified at Eichmann, the Eichmann trial, he said, this is the end of the European, the European phase of Jewish history. I would actually go to follow up on that. that I'm glad you bring, bring Salo Baron, because he, of course, his reaction to 
that brush with history that, and of course he, like all the people she's surrounded by are from there, right? right. She is from here, goes there and returns. Right. So that's the sort of negotiation of her Americanness and her Polishness, Jewishness, whatever you wanna, wanna call it. But Sala Baron spends his energy differently to document what was lost by focusing on the civilization, but the life, not the, not anti-Semitism, not the destruction, but, but on that whole culture and what made it possible. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how she was able to square the idea of all that, you know, the floor, the, her love for the Jewish people, right? That was her motivation of her, for her work. But also that idea that, you know, the Jewish culture flourished was the, the quote that you, you gave from, from the golden tradition that it was, you know, the cradle of Jewish civilization, all that stuff with that visceral feeling about Poland as this hostile place for Jews. Well, I mean, I think it's actually, it actually is a, in some ways becomes a political question. And um, she, she sort of get, for, so first of all, she gets her historiographic, um, it's not only Baron is important, but because she studies with him, but Dubnov and, and the historiographic tradition of, of Eastern European Jewish writing is more important. I, I have an article where I call her Dubnov's other daughter. But I want to also say something about uh, Kalmanovich, extremely important to her personally. So there's an effective tie with Zelig and Rivala Kalmanovich. But Kalmanovich, importantly, is a diaspora nationalist and a territorialist. He leaves the Soviet Union, so he's a fierce anti-communist. And he is very suspicious of political ideologies. And he rejects the idea that Jewish survival will depend on harnessing the Jews, if you will, to one political system. Because his view of Jewish history and of the Jewish experience is that even in times of difficulty, I mean, I don't, I mean he, oppression or discrimination, what we might say, Jewish culture can flourish, right? Jewish culture can flourish. It's not necessarily that the most liberal tolerant societies will allow the flourishing of Jewish culture. And by the way, that does link back to Boron, right? Of course, the, the, the challenge of modernity, right? Um, what, what political, what state systems will allow autonomous Jewish culture to flourish? And one of the complexities is the blessings of emancipation, right? Once you have an open society um, in which Jews can fully participate, what will happen to Jewish group identity? So I just wanna say, uh, there's so many things I wanna say, this Weinreich and others already were struggling with in the interwar years in Europe, in Poland, right? Because of linguistic Polonization, right? By the end of the thirties, most Jewish children, even if they come from Yiddish speaking homes are speaking Polish and reading Polish because they're, they're going to school in Polish, right? Even if they're going to Jewish schools, even if they're in, you know, uh, Beis Yaakov, they're studying Polish too. So linguistic assimilation is a given. Um, and then of course, in the American context, it's a given, you know, all the more so. So what will allow Jewish groupness and group identity? And Baron, you know, nailed it already in Ghetto and in that, you know, myth of, you know the, the, the mythos of Ghetto and Emancipation, that Jewish singularity and distinctiveness could in fact flourish in medieval and early modern times, even if the political system seemed to be, you know, religiously intolerant. In fact, Jewish culture could flourish. So I think I'm, I don't wanna get myself into, into the circle here, but she uh, is aware of that. And Kalmanovich is very aware of that. And when he gives a speech, um, a territorialist at a territorialist meeting in the interwar, she attends it and people accuse him of being a fascist because he doesn't say that, you know, being left is gonna define and defend and uh, support Jewish culture. And so, he's accused of being a fascist. Nancy, I want to ask you, I was so intrigued at the beginning of the book, you compare the New York intellectuals to the Maskilim, the men of the Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment, right? Uh -huh. And so I have a couple of questions coming out of that. Um, the New York intellectuals were largely secular. 
right? Um, and I, so I guess that is the secularizing trend then of modernity. Right. right. One thing that interested me and puzzled me a bit was Davidovich's turn not so much to religiosity, but to religion and its centrality in Jewish identity. So I'm very interested in that in terms of her Yiddish secularist origins, right? Uh, whatever then the European experience is and how it might play into her eventual turn to religion. I mean, this is in a way, one thing I found fascinating about the book is it's the evolution of an American identity that has such a strong contribution to evolving conceptions of Jewish Americanness at the, in, over these years, right? So anyway, there's a bunch of questions. <laughs> right. So let's, so the, the, the Muscovium, the reason why I positioned her that way is, um, and partly let's blame, blame and salute Irving Howe, you know, in his famous um, essay on the New York intellectuals, where he coins the phrase, he says they are an intelligentsia. And I know in Russian historiography and in Polish historiography, people have written books about the meaning of the intelligentsia because it actually has a social status in different ways in the United States. But I was using it as, you know, intellectuals with a public facing mission. Indeed. And that's what the Haskalah was. The Haskalah was didactic. The idea was not that you would just write a treatise, you know, everything, and, and masculine from Western to Eastern Ashkenaz, but the idea was that it would have a public um, didactic effect, right? That people, I mean, they were wrong, right? I mean, they were really wrong, even though there's so much fun to read, but they, you know, they really believe that if people read their satires, I'm thinking um, on the Sarah Levy book, I start with Lexan and Fremelai, you know, if a really smart Jew read the, read the satire of, uh, of the fall of the, you know, um, duplicitous Talmud Torah, student, they would know the real truth of the moderate Haskalah, but they're trying to change the Jewish public. That was the goal of Haskalah. Lucy Davidovich, uh, the New York intellectuals were trying to, if not so much change, but make an imprint on the American public. You know, this is the way you're supposed to behave. This is what we do as public intellectuals. This is the, these are the, um, the attitudes that we as Americans should have towards, you know, anti-war peace, cosmopolitanism, integrationism, etc. Lucy Davidovich is the same, but her audience is to the Jews, right? She wants Jews to wake up to the glories of Jewish civilization. She wants them to know what they've lost. She wants them to be involved in the, uh, in the creation, in the future of something vital called Jewish collective identity. I mean, that's what's her motivation. So mm -hmm. I, hope that, I hope that addressed the idea of the Haskalah. I mean, I guess for some people, it's a stretch because you can't write about the 18th century and you can't write about the 20th. But in my view, and I think this is absolutely true, whether or not they like my analogy, you know, Jewish modernization does not happen in one fell swoop. It is a process and it's very different regionally. It's different in France and it's different in England. It's different in Austrian Poland. It's different in Russia. It's different in the United States. So just because we have these concepts of modernization and secularization and the separation of church and state, it doesn't happen in one fell swoop. And as Manta and I have talked about, you know, in Eastern Europe, you know, a lot of the people living there wouldn't know modernity hit them on the head necessarily. You know, they're not necessarily reading the text or experiencing yet modernity, even when they become citizens of the Second Pol Polish Republic, they still are living in a very traditional way, which of course is why the Soviet project, which is a project of modernization is so brutal, right? Because the Soviets have to modernize their wide empire quickly right, to catch up with the West. And it's a brutal, brutal project of modernization. We all know the famine in Ukraine, <coughs> everything like that. So getting back to her, I went off, but I couldn't help it. But getting back to her, her own evolution or her coming from secular, the men, the Jewish intellect, the New York intellectuals were secular, almost to a man, except interestingly, Norman Podharetz, who's sort of a young one, studies both at Columbia and at the seminary. He's very steeped in Jewish learning. You know, whatever one thinks about him, you gotta give his credit about what he knows. Um, Howe and Bell know Yiddish, but Howe really embraces his Jewishness later, The World of Our Fathers, his anthologizing of Yiddish literature with Lazy Greenberg. And by the way, just to tell your audience, um, 
you know, Lucy Davidovich was the reader on Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers and the correspondence between them about secularism as the definition of Yiddishkeit, they tangle over it. Mm -hmm. And she says to him, you're wrong. That's not what Yiddishkeit is. Yiddishkeit is the civilizational, uh, the civilizational Jewishness of Eastern Europe. And she appeals to Weinreich and she appeals to uh, Salman Birnbaum, the son of Nussen Birnbaum, the uh, Zionist who then becomes a, a Guda representative. Yiddishkeit means derech hashas. Yiddishkeit means the ways of the Talmud, the way in which Jewish religiosity, Judaism is embedded in the entire civilization of Eastern Europe. And that's what she thinks Yiddishkeit is, not secular left-wing you know, uh, uh, Yiddishism. And because of that, this is what leads her to a intellectual rapprochement, if you will, with trying to understand what Judaism is. You know, she can't just switch a light bulb and start going to synagogue and think that's gonna make sense. But she comes to the conclusion that you can't dismiss the embeddedness of religion in, in Jewish life and that modern Jews at their own peril will dismiss it. And that's her problem with communists. And um, besides uh, Weinreich and Birnbaum, the other person who's extremely important to her in this conundrum and solution is Leibish Lehrer. Leibish Lehrer is a secularist, a Yiddishist, and a social psychologist. And he's an understudied figure, but he wrote a lot on the meaning of symbols and rituals for secular Jews and the problem of coming up with workable rituals and symbols that would have the kind of meta, meta you know, metaphilosophical meaning that religious symbols and rituals have. So he ran school systems for Yiddish, uh, for Yiddishist children and ran a camp for secular Yiddish kids. But when he did a survey of the graduates, he was in the 60s, he was sorely disappointed because they had basically, they celebrated Hanukkah and Passover and they were illiterate in Jewish languages. And um, as he said, it became a form of assimilation. So that's fascinating. So it's less a matter of religious feeling or conviction on her part, but really an insight into its centrality to the culture that she dedicated herself. Absolutely. To observing absolutely. and admitting. Mm -hmm. She said, she, you know, absolutely. I mean, she said as much in some ways. She was a, she said she was a, a Chase Manhattan. She kept, She's a Chase Manhattan dietary Jew because she opened up a bank account and they gave her a second set of dishes. <laughs> she says that in one of her interviews and that allowed her to separate her dishes. She though, you know, so she had a quote kosher home, but by the way, she probably, those moves happened after Shimon's death in 1979. Shimon was an East European secularist for whom the Yiddishkeit was in him. He didn't need to perform it. And in fact, and I cite this in the book, when they moved from Queens to Manhattan, to 86th Street, she, Lucy wanted to put up a mezuzah and he was very reluctant. Mm -hmm. He said that that will distinguish us. I don't wanna do that. There may have been some trauma and some fear there. I, you know, there, I don't have his documents, by the way, that she probably did. If there were any documents from him to her, I don't have them. Um, they, they're not extant. So she, but when he died, well, look, Think in human terms, she's alone, she's supporting herself, she's seeking comfort and refuge in people who care about the things she cares about that. And she found that in, in certain male figures, which again, doesn't surprise. David Mursky, at, um, who was the Dean at um, Yeshiva College, who was a great polymath and a very open-minded Orthodox figure, Saul Berman, um, these were the people she turned to and they helped give her an entryway into the rituals of Jewish life. But she wasn't a believer. I mean, it's not, it's not like Birnbaum. If you go back and read um, Nussen Birnbaum, he talks about having a some kind of religious experience when he's on a, on a boat. And Jess Olson has written about this. And that's not, it's more instrumental for her, if you, if you will. Well, that, that's kind of downputting, but I don't mean that. But it is more instrumental. If I could follow up, there was a question from the audience and we want to leave some time for audience questions. Uh, you characterize uh, Davidovich as a diaspora nationalist. 
Um, and the question has to do with the place of Israel and Zionism in that constellation, how you would see that for her. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, very, it's a very, it's a great question because, you know, if you, if you take off, I always do this with my students, I make a grid based on Ezra Mendelssohn's slim but very smart book on modern Jewish politics. You know, what are the differences between diaspora nationalists and Zionists? And it's really place, place. Other things, you know, youth culture, militancy, Bar Kokhba, you know, Hanukkah rebels, um, it's place, right? Um, they're very, so they're very similar. The movements, I mean, frankly, Zionism is a diaspora nationalist ideology. It's born in the diaspora to solve the Jewish problem in the diaspora, but the solution is out migration, right? So, but for Davido, so for Davido, she doesn't figure in her life for most of the time, meaning she comes out of this you know, quasi Bundist, her husband, and her husband is a Bundist, you know, people at the Evo were sort of left, they're anti-Zionists, right? You want to read polemics against the Zionists? Read Bundist rhetoric, right? They go tooth and nail against the Zionists. But Zionism, very much similar to what you pointed your finger at in terms of, quote, religion, she makes an instrumental turn. Mm -hmm. She makes an instrumental turn. She comes to the conclusion, and um, again, great correspondence with Irving Howe, that Israel represents the embodiment of the Jewish people, full stop. And once you hear that in her voice, then you know she's going to be supportive of the modern state of Israel politically. And that's exactly what happens. Right. In the late 60s, when, when the, that brief period from 1945 to 1967, right? It's all of what, 22 years when kind of Israel is the, the David in the Middle East and the champion and, 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 you know, the victim and everything we know. After the Six Day War, geopolitics changes. Israel is increasingly isolated. The UN changes, right? Zionism is racism. The International Women's Conference in Mexico City. When the left, quote unquote, and I know this is, you know, has to be somewhat discursive, but when the left champions the cause of Palestinians against the Jews of Israel and positions the Jews of Israel in the modern state of Israel as oppressive as other governments that are oppressive and imperialist the way the United States has been imperialist in Vietnam, when, those in, when that's all combined, and by the way, this is a moment we're in today, how do we nuance the difference between, and I'm not just talking about Israel, I'm talking about any regional conflict, how do we understand its specificity? But when that is um, conflated by the left, she goes, she defends the Jews and Israel as the embodiment of the Jewish people. She has friends in Israel. Her most beloved friend, Pearl Ketcher, is a British doctor who ran the DP camps in the British zone, ran the hospitals there, and that's a whole story. Lucy was in Hamburg when the refugees of the Exodus were disembarked. So she's watching Zionism unfold in the British zone of occupied Germany in the post-war years, but she doesn't write about it it kind of didn't, it didn't make much of an impression on her until there's this political change. And she feels strongly that Israel is the embodiment of the Jewish people and therefore Jews in the diaspora should support Israel. Right, yes. You know, uh, perhaps I, I think I can combine a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one asks about Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, who is one of those to whom your book is dedicated. And the question is if Lucy Davidovich had any contact with him. And there's another part to that question, or I'll put that together with a question about your relationship as a biographer to your subject, what it's like to live with Lucy Davidovich. Okay, so I'll separate the two. So you're I don't know who asked the question. I guess if the chat is saved, I can see it. But I love, I, I'm so grateful for that question because I can tell a great story. And I know that stories and anecdotes are not, quote, anecdata, but it's still a great story. Um, so Yosem Chaim Yerushalmi went to Camp Boivarek. Ah, I didn't. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting to think about. I mean, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi was an extremely interesting, complicated, and multilingual person, but he went to Camp Boivarek. That's one thing. Um, so he knew some of that world. Um, and when I, when I published um, the reissue of her memoir, which has a beautiful picture of her, um, not the picture that the last picture of the screen, but it's a young woman in the library in Vilna. 
uh, we, the press put it on the cover and I was able to bring it to him, which was very gratifying. And at the time I was just muddling around in all these archives and trying to figure out what I was going to write about. I told him th about what I was doing and, and he listened in his way. <laughs> but when he saw the picture of her, he really, he lit up because he did know her. You know, she was often the only woman in the room in what was then called the field of Jewish studies. I mean, we forget, We maybe some people don't forget, but if you look at old AJS programs, she's the only one on the program. Yeah. She, attended, she attended the Center for Israel and Jewish Studies, um, its faculty seminar. She attended it. She was one of the only women in the room. I mean, maybe Jen Gerber, I, I don't even know. Um, maybe Naomi Cohen, but really she was, and I, and I have that picture in my book of her. She's very short. She's not even five foot one with all of these men, yeah. you know, she really was an outlier that way. She was East European. She came from a working class background. She didn't have good teeth. I know that sounds crazy, but it says something of the generation. She was a married woman who had to work. She didn't have the money for fancy clothes and she was the only woman in the room. So this also is part of her life. So she did know Yosef. In fact, at one point, um, I'm forgetting if she couldn't give a paper and she read his or he, he definitely knew her. And when I gave him the um, uh, biography, uh, the memoir, he was very happy. And he told me a really funny story about Boybrick, about um, the way the music instructor would uh, come up with all these different ditties for each of the nations in Yiddish. I mean, you have to understand these camp counselors were not like, you know, libidinal adolescents. They were like East European Jewish intellectuals who needed to make extra money. And so these camps were run by these incredible people, really, you know, and Gershon Cohen, Levi Schler. I mean, this was not like my kids when they were a camp counselor. So, um, so they did know each other. And she also knew my other, my other Dr. Fatter, Michael Stanislavski, because she attended the, uh, um, the faculty seminar at Columbia. The other thing is she, and I didn't get to talk about it today because there was too much to talk about, but you know, when Polish Jewish relations and the study of Polish Jewish relations kind of hit the academy in the seventies and eighties, people at Columbia wanted her to participate in one of the early conferences on Polish Jewish relations. Um, Harold Siegel asked her to participate. And she was like, no way. I know the Poles, they're just gonna go after me. They've already re-entitled my book, The War Against the Poles. So, you know, her attitudes towards uh, Polish, the participation of Poles in what went on, you know, uh, in the Holocaust, I, I mean, complicit, she never used the word complicit or collaborate, but she said they didn't, at the end of the day, many Poles did not mind that the Germans had solved their Jewish problem. I mean, she had harsh words. So she was not interested in getting into the room with a Polish nationalist who would talk about Polish suffering. She wasn't, she said, no way. And the other thing about me, oh my goodness, you know, I've worked at this book. We'll have to close and, with that, yeah, but that's it's fine. a really good way to end. It. <laughs> yes, please. You no, no, to... I just want to say that I lived in the book a long time and I have, um, you know, you can't work on something for so long if there's not something about it that speaks to you. So I think I'll just say that we all know we write from positions of subjectivity. And I did my best to be um, honest to the historical record. And I'll just say that that's why I wrote the appendix and not the appendix, excuse me, the epilogue. I stepped out of the biographical voice in my epilogue yes. and to, to assess her relationship to writing history, her relationship to historical agency and to show the blind spots that she had particularly regarding black Americans and East Europeans living under Soviet rule. And I, I, I needed to do that as an intellectual to say, don't get me wrong, I know where the blind spots are. Mm -hmm. You've done that so well. Yeah. So I think that we have to close, but I wanna thank you, Nancy. This has been an extraordinary afternoon. Thanks for sharing your work with us. Yes, my pleasure over and over again to both of you. Um, and I want to jump in and say thank you to Nancy and to Anne and to Magda and to all of you for coming. Um, I learned a ton in the last hour and a half. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I hope um, that, um, that everyone joins us for our next event on Wednesday next week. Um, and Nancy, good luck also as you um, work on your new projects um, and new historical adventures. So thank you again. Thank you so much.